Okay, I'm going to start letting people in now. Okay. sitting is everyone else in Johannesburg or I'm in Durban, You're in I'm Durban. In, I am in Bryanston I'm in Pretoria okay well I'm also in KZN I'm in the highway area so we're all spread out of it yeah <laughs> is it cold or it is cold um I think there might be another thunderstorm later today oh really yeah apparently there was a big one I think it was yesterday it was yeah it's cold and wet. Yeah, we've had, it's a, obviously a very widespread front, which we need so badly. And we we've need had it for, badly, we've had some, badly. Like four or five days now, we've had rain on and off. Okay, we're ready to start. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third the third webinar in our series. This is a series that started by the schools program, the WESA schools program. And we've had so much fun over this past um, three sessions, um, two sessions and the third one, I'm sure we will have fun as well. Um, it's been interesting, engaging to, with, with amazing speakers so far. And I'm sure today's speakers will also not disappoint. So um, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Nomfundo, who's going to introduce the topic and also um, share with you the, the speakers who will be on today. Um, but before we do that, I just want to again go through the house rules. So I'm not sure why my... my here we go. So the house rules, uh, once again, only the panelist video will be shown. Um, attendees are on mute, but you can engage with us in the chat box on your right. There's also a question and answer session. You can direct um, your questions directly to the panelists. Um, and then also the session will be recorded and will be available on our website. You can go to wesa.org.za, news media and videos. So now I'll hand over to Nomfundo, who will facilitate the session and introduce the speakers. Thank you, Lamise. Uh, let me just share my screen. Uh, Lamise, can, my, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nungfun Dundlovo, and welcome to our third webinar in the series, which is following on from Cindy's webinar, where she unpacked the topic of environmental justice. So today we're talking about one of the biggest injustices, not just in South Africa, but globally, and that is food inequality. We know that food has been at the center of the pandemic and, you know, living in a country like South Africa with so much inequality, the COVID-19 crisis has really shown us how fragile our food systems are. And according to just the recent uh, coronavirus rapid mobile survey, over 1 million people actually lost their jobs uh, during this pandemic and have fallen into poverty and are now known as the new vulnerable. Furthermore, the climate crisis has worsened uh, the hunger crisis. 
So today's topic is food sovereignty uh, through the empowerment of schools. This is a, a fairly new term that was coined in the late uh, 90s. It's about giving power back to communities to take charge of their destiny by defining their own uh, food systems. So we just, we're asking, is having enough to eat good enough? What about the quality of that food? Where does that food come from? Is it culturally appropriate food? And are the food systems environmentally friendly? And really, can schools be empowered to transform our current unsustainable uh, food systems? Perhaps the pandemic uh, could be an opportunity for us to advance uh, food sovere sovereignty in South Africa. I'm now going to introduce our two speakers for the day. Our first speaker is Dr. Alison Nisselhorn, who is the Director and Research Strategy at the Lunchbox Fund. She holds a PhD in food security. The Lunchbox Fund addresses uh, unemployment and poverty in South Africa through facilitating sustained and enriched educational opportunities. And they've provided over 25 uh, million meals to children since uh, their inception. Dr. Misselhorn will be highlighting the food security challenges and key issues from an NGO perspective. Our second speaker for today is Ms. Mamokele Mami Majuna, who's currently employed by the Department of Basic Education as a Chief Education Specialist uh, for Sustainable Food Production in Schools. She is responsible for promoting sustainable food production initiative, focusing mainly on food gardens and schools. And she has over 40 years of experience in the education sector. Ms. Mamokele Majuna will be sharing with us more on the National School Nutrition Program, where the program is, and just the status of food gardening uh, in South Africa and schools. Uh, please feel free to share your questions with us in the, to the panelists in the chat and Q&A uh, session of our webinar. I'm now going to hand over to doc, uh, Dr. Misselhorn. Um, over to you. Great. Thanks, Numfundo. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. Let's hope this works. Okay, so as you've heard, I'm from the Lunchbox Fund. I'm really excited to be talking about this topic because I think it's something that's incredibly important. And I, I think as you'll sort of see in the next few slides and as Nungfun has already alluded to, it's an issue that's really become very topical in the, last, um, in the last few months. And I think more South Africans have also become aware of it. What does Lunchbox Fund do? Well, we are an education-focused uh, nonprofit. Um, our aim is to uh, facilitate education opportunities through meal provision in, in schools, in preschools, in after-school programs. Um, currently, or well, before lockdown, we were reaching around 30,000 children a day, and that's throughout the country. So the, the mandate that I was given um, by Nomfunda was, was quite broad. Um, the question was, how can schools be empowered to strengthen food security and advance food sovereignty? Where are we? What we know? The role of NGOs and partners, and lessons from the pandemic. That was the that was the subject title. So there's a lot packed away in there, and I have ten minutes just to run through some of the key things that have come up for Lunchbox Fund in particular over the last few months, um, and something of our own experience in the in the food security arena. Mungfunda has already um, run through a bit of a definition. I'll I'll uh, whiz through through that again. My PhD is in food security, so this is an area where um, that's close to my heart. And, and I think the more you work in the area, the more you realize that it's, food security is linked to all dynamics of life and livelihood. So it, it's, not a, it's not a simple subject, and it's very context-specific. Uh, but food security has been defined as the state of having reliable access to sufficient quantity of affordable and nutritious food. So note in there the, the, um, the element of, of food quality, which Mpunbe mentioned, very important. And I think that's, it's something that historically was neglected in food security. 
and that to some extent is coming back to bite us now. Um, so having access not only to enough food, enough calories, but enough um, food that, is, that has uh, a, a good nutritional delivery going along with it. So that's, that's kind of a technical definition. But what food security doesn't do is necessarily unpack how we achieve it. And I think this is where food sovereignty has increasingly tried to go. And as Mufundo says, it's a, a more recent idea um, or concept. Um, and I think of it as, as more one of the sort of foundations of food security. As she says, it's a, it's, it links very strongly to social um, justice and to political rights. Uh, and it's really about the right for people to determine for themselves how to procure, how to produce food that they find sustaining, that is culturally appropriate. Um, it's very much a rights-based approach and it sits more on the political side. It's, it's, a, it's a means to achieve food security is one way of looking at it. Um, yeah, that's just a little sort of summary definition, which I won't run through. I'm sure we can share these presentations with um, participants after, afterwards if, if people would like them. So what have we learned from, um, from the COVID-19 pandemic over the last few months? Well, I just want to highlight four areas that, that kind of sprang up for us. And the first is really that uh, C-19 very quickly exposed the precarious nature of livelihoods in South Africa. Um, it exposed that underlying vulnerability the majority of South Africans live on the edge of hunger and poverty. Um, and I think that's also something that many South Africans are very unaware of. Unemployment prior to lockdown was at around 27%. And when that non-essential services shut down, millions more jobs were lost. And as Nomfundo says, there's, there are many that remain, um, remain lost, essentially. And then as poverty escalated, so, so have food prices escalated, which has further deepened uh, food insecurity. The cries for help for emergency food relief were, were rapid. They were immediate, directly to us and through many of our partner organizations as well. Then the second thing really I think that, that people became rapidly aware of was this reliance on school nutrition. So unemployment coincided, and this is important, with the, the daily school nutrition suddenly no longer being available to some 9 million children um, reliant on the National School Nutrition Program in primary and secondary schools. Uh, and, and similarly so for 2.7 million is the estimate children in the Early Childhood Development Centre who attend um, out-of-home care facilities and receive some sort of meal there. Um, I think that the ECD sector um, has been particularly well or unfortunately well profiled through the, through the pandemic. And there was a report very early on in COVID um, that Elifa Labantana released on the impact of COVID on the ECD sector and the closure of early child development centers. And their estimate was that around 30,000 early child development centers um, are considered marginal and they're considered marginal why because they, they they're quasi formal they're not supported by the department of social development um, yet they provide the only out of home stimulation and child care available to around one and a half million uh, young children preschool children so and that care is obviously variable but it's nevertheless quite critical both for parents in terms of being able to work, but also for that child's development and that child's stimulation and, and preparation for, for school readiness. And Lunchbox Fund supports a lot of these ECDCs with, with nutrition support daily. And then the other, th the final thing was really that the policy responses, while they were um, far reaching and they were, they were compelling, they were, um, they were extensive, the policy, the social protection reforms that were brought into place, but they were inevitably slower than, than they, they should have been or than the need required them to be. Um, they came in two stages. If you remember, it was I think the 25th of March and um, just after mid-April, these reforms were announced and they, they were social insurance to millions who'd been in formal employment and who'd found themselves um, in the basket of unemployed and, and reliable for unemployment insurance. Um, 
there were also supplements to existing social grants. And then there was also the new emergency grants linked to COVID-19. So these reforms were unprecedented, as I said, um, but they inevitably took time um, to filter down to actually have an impact on the ground. And we also need to always bear in mind that social protection doesn't reach everybody. There's a number of people who fall through that safety net because access to social protection is shaped by factors like means testing, um, whether you're a citizen, whether you have the necessary documentation, your health, your ability to travel, your location, etc. So many of the uneducated um, or elderly or foreign nationals um, become much harder to reach through social protection mechanisms. But civil society can and did respond very rapidly um, to COVID-19 amidst a bunch of challenges, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. Um, so, and I think that that was a very, a very hopeful thing. And I think that this is something that we need to, we need to ride on, on the, the momentum that's, that's picked up in, in, in the civil society sector around the implications of relief feeding and food security. So um, Lunchbox Fund, we, what we did was we quickly pivoted our um, school nutrition program to emergency feeding. Obviously, we weren't doing school nutrition because the schools were all closed in the early stages of lockdown. And by collaborating with thousands of grassroots organizations, CBOs on the ground, NPOs on the ground, we were able to reach um, the, the latest figures I have are around 185,000 families, um, which equates to around 740,000 um, individuals, um, children and adults, with 22 million meals over, over the last month. And that would not have been possible without very extensive uh, civil society collaboration and of course donor willingness. Um, we were very fortunate to receive um, Solidarity Fund uh, support as well as ENCA, uh, HCI funding and that really provided the foundation and impetus for a number of private donors and, and in, uh, um, private donors and CSR orientated organizations to for corporate social responsibility to step in and contribute to the relief feeding effort. I included a few um, photos just to just to give you a sense of and they're quick to run through so it's worth just having a little bit of a, a sense of the visual um, reality of of that effort so it was rural areas it was informal settlements it was really all geographic locations across the country and quite unprecedented for us, we've never ventured into relief feeding. We've never had to venture into relief feeding before. Um, and we, we just found ourselves in a unique position for which we now look back and consider ourselves very grateful for. So to, to, to just have a little look at what is the current food security situation in South Africa, well, um, food security is very difficult to measure directly. There are various indicators of food security. There's the Household Food Security and Access Index and, and various other measures. We, we generally use proxies because these are more available at national level. And some of the national level indicators I've just quickly included here to give a sense of it. Um, so we know that around 27% of children under five in South Africa are stunted. That's, um, that's below height uh, for their age. 44% um, uh, suffer from um, vitamin A deficiency. About two and a half million young children live below the food poverty line. And then there's this last aspect, which I've included because it's important when we talk about food quality, is uh, the fact that around 13% of children um, under 18 are overweight. Um, overweight or obese. So what's happened with that, and it's worth just touching on that a little bit further, and, and this is something some of you might have, might have read up about or know about, or, 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 and, and all of you will have observed firsthand. Um, what we're seeing is globalization of diets across the world um, has led to uh, a high level of access to processed foods, 
um, foods that are less healthy, the so-called nutrition transition from low quality, from high quality nutritious, nutrient dense foods to low quality, high calorie foods. So foods that are high in sugar, high in fat, that are readily available and actually are many of them very affordable. And because they um, are palatable, because they have flavorants and sugar and oil and so forth added, they are often the preferred choice, even at, even for um, for people at, at, who have low spending power, low buying power. So as a consequence, we're seeing a, a, a big rise in the occurrence of stunting occurring alongside overweight and obesity. We're seeing this in the same communities. We're seeing it even in the same households, even in the same child. So in, in some of our impact evaluations um, and, and the same as found in other studies, you have children who are stunted, but also obese. So that's a situation where the child has received enough calories, um, but the quality of those calories has not enabled their, their bodies to, to grow height-wise the way that they should have. I think if we're going to talk about um, if we're going to talk about the role of, of schools in 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 food sovereignty and sovereignty and food security, we need to we need to understand some of the, the causes of food insecurity. So I have included a slide um, on that. We know that enough food is produced globally, and I'm sure this is something everybody knows and has heard often to feed the world. Um, so very fundamentally, the core issue with regard to global food insecurity and even South African food, secu food insecurity is about poverty and inequality and unequal access to food resources. Um, so food insecurity in, in, in the broader sense really remains then a function of livelihoods and resource access. But then there are also local dynamics of, uh, of food availability, and this is linked to food imports, national food imports, but also local food imports, local food movements, uh, retail, et cetera, et cetera. Um, food pricing, and, and again, what food is, is transported, what food is imported, what food is available locally. And then the area that I'm, I know um, will be touched on as we, proceed through the next hour or so of the webinar um, is local food production and, and school gardens, um, food gardens. What we know is that this plays a very important role in dietary diversity. So while food gardens aren't something that Lunchbox Fund um, focuses on directly, um, we know they play a role in access to seasonal um, micronutrients um, and they, of course, can also play a role in education. One of the challenges linked to that is something that, um, that's been known for since the 70s and 80s, really, and it came up again quite a bit when I was, when I was studying my postgraduate study, is that th this, this idea of de-agrarianization, so the move, from the, the, the move from farming to more urbanal, urbanals, urbanized lifestyles, um, and that's had a huge effect on local food production. Um, and it's partly caused by a decreased interest, um, by particularly younger people, in engaging in agricultural, in agriculture and, 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 and crop uh, production. So, to screech into the last slide, um, how can schools be empowered? And I, again, just wanted to to provide some contextual ideas around this. There's really not enough time to go, th go through anything in much depth, but um, I'm sure Ms. Maduna will also, I'm pretty sure she's gonna unpack quite a lot around food gardens and, and the wealth there. Um, so from our perspective, in terms of what, what, what we understand around the role of schools is, if we think back to the previous slide and poverty and the role of livelihoods, Schools obviously have an, an absolutely critical role to play in, um, in enabling young people to, to reach their potential, to be able to build livelihoods um, for themselves, 
as they graduate through school and leave school. And that's not necessarily employment, it often is, but it's also a livelihood that may be based in the informal sector, it may be based even on subsistence farming. But we know that um, unemployment is much higher um, amongst those who haven't completed schooling than amongst those who, who have in South Africa. Education also enables um, young people to become change agents in their community, to influence the people around them, to be leaders. Um, and again, that's about fulfilling potential. One of the key issues, um, and of course, I'm wearing the Lunchbox Fund hat here, and, and I've seen this so much firsthand, is the availability of school meals. So school nutrition, particularly obviously in the lower quintile schools, uh, and this is, of course, what the National School Nutrition Program is addressing. We meet the needs of those children who perhaps need an added breakfast. Um, if the NSNP is providing lunch, lunchbox fund in very, very poor communities may provide a breakfast meal. And we also support community schools. And then, of course, all the preschools, which aren't, which, which fall under DSD, not, not education. But that provision of that meal, we know, of course, is a, an incentive for parents, for caregivers to enroll their children in, in places of education and schools. Uh, it's it's an attendance incentive, a daily attendance incentive. And then critically, it alleviates hunger while that child is in the place of educational and enables them to actually benefit from the stimulation and the information and the learning that's been offered and develop the skills that they need. Um, and this, of course, applies to families, particularly who are food insecure, where, where, where food quantity and food quality at home is generally very poor. And in the same vein, preschool education is critical for this because we know that around there was recent studies using the early learning outcomes measure, which some of you may know of, um, which found that around 90% of children in, in, um, who, in quintile one communities present grade unready, um, or school unready rather, in grade one. So they arrive on their first day of school, not really up to the task of the information that, that, that grade one will require them to come, come to, to tackle, to come to terms with. And this is a, a setback that's very hard to write later on in, um, in a child's education. I think the other thing is that schools can obviously have a, a role to play in nutrition education and food choices. Um, we don't do nutrition education. It's not primarily my field, um, but it's quite clear that that has to be embedded in the education system for kids, especially kids where there's interest in, in, in that kind of thing. Um, and then of course, food gardens, which I know we're gonna, we're gonna talk more about. Um, some of the pitfalls that we've seen regarding food gardens, and again, I'm sure Ms. Maduna will be able to unpack this more um, from her wealth of experience, but even, even when I was working with communities directly in the, in the late 90s, um, we, we regularly saw the difficulties regarding access to resources for agricultural inputs, um, obviously livestock taking out um, crops, um, because fencing falls apart or there isn't any fencing, water availability. For schools, the closure during holidays is a challenge. Um, and we've seen this, we've seen this in the primary and secondary schools we've worked in and in the ECD sector where food gardens can do wonderfully and then school holidays come along and there's no custodian who is managing them through the holidays and they, they sort of falter. But they do, as I said earlier, they definitely play a role. Uh, and I think it's a very important role in promoting local availability of seasonally, um, seasonal food that, that's rich in appropriate nutrients. The only element that I would add to this that, that's not on the slide is um, yeah, the role of civil, civil society. And I think that, as I alluded to earlier, I think that... Um, We've said you know what COVID 19 has really taught Lunchbox Fund is there's we're not doing this on our own by any means. Um, and civil society can be quite nimble, um, we can act quite quickly if we collaborate and we have a common goal. And I think that's something that we need to think creatively about leveraging, um, looking ahead and, and, and thinking about schools, education, food security, food sovereignty. 
and I'm sure some of those things will be discussed in the Q&A. So I think that's, that's it from me. Thank you, Dr. Nissel uh, Horn, for sharing with us such an insightful uh, presentation and letting us in on just the food security challenges in the country and how an NGO such as the Lunchbox Fund has responded during this time and just giving us a picture of what uh, food sovereignty might look like in the context of South Africa. I think we will now go to our second speaker, Ms. Lama Medina, for her presentation. I will be sharing your screen for you. So can I go ahead? Yes, go ahead. When I do this. Uh... All right. <laughs> uh, good. Afternoon, uh, colleagues, and thank you very much, uh, Nomfundo, for extending an invitation to us to get involved in these discussions. And taking from uh, my colleague, the previous uh, presenter's um, presentation, I think we need more of uh, these discussions. Um, I will, uh, I will not go through the whole uh, presentation because there are, there are overlaps in it. Uh, the first, yes, I will not go through the, the, the definitions because uh, the previous speaker uh, 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 explained that, but what I just want to explain is that uh, with the food sovereignty, it's really a, an empowering a instrument because it gives the, the individuals or the community the right to, to decide the type of food and how to produce that food. It's not just accepting any food. Then um, there are, with regard to the Department of Education, they are an enabling legislative framework. I think these are the instruments that give the citizens and the communities to hold the, the, the department or, or government accountable. And I will just refer to the, to the last three, which my colleague have also referred to which is a curriculum assessment policy statement. Um, there are, uh, there are, in the curriculum, there are, there, there are three streams of education, which is the academic stream, the vocational stream, and the occupational stream. And those streams provide an opportunity for the children to learn agriculture, for future studies or for livelihood skills or for entre entre entrepreneurship. The two streams, that is the vocational and occupational, it's not really hard, hard agriculture, it's just for livelihood and for entrepreneurship. And currently the department is working on a, a syllabus or a curriculum for special schools, that is agriculture for special schools, which is mainly for skills. And at the end, I'll show you uh, some uh, evidence of special schools that are um, really doing well in terms of uh, teaching agriculture as well as a uh, nutrition education. Then the rural education policy is less than five years. Uh, this is a, a recognition and acknowledgement that there, needs, there is a need to focus on uh, rural areas. Uh, my, my colleague has already indicated that there is a movement from rural area. Land is, lay, is lying fallow. People are moving to, to, to the cities. So this rural education policy, and there's a 
a, a fully fledged um, directorate to deal with that, and they are already working on it. It's recognizing that in the rural areas, uh, there should be a focus to use available resources in 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 those uh, 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 in those areas, and then also to use indigenous knowledge to recognize uh, indigenous knowledge in this uh, in those areas. Then the last one is the Division of Revenue Act which has a conditional grant framework for national school nutrition program. That one indicates uh, the provision of budget to contribute to, towards food security. That is how the school nutrition is funded and how much goes to a provision of meals and how much should go to and what is expected of the school nutrition program. Then, uh, 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 the school nutrition program, uh, which my colleague have, have referred to, the, the program used to, to focus on, uh, on provision of, of meals only. But now, no fundo, <laughs> do you see me? <laughs> but now it, it's focusing on three areas. The first one where the bulk of the, the funding uh, 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 goes to is provision of meals to the learners. And this is to enhance uh, a learning capacity uh, to ensure that hunger is not a barrier to learning. Then the second focus area, which is the responsibility of school nutrition program, is to promote nutrition education among school communities, not in school only then also to promote the establishment of and sustenance of school food gardens. And it is actually not only school food gardens, but any other food production initiative that uh, can be promoted, that can be implemented in the, in the, in the, in the schools. Now, provision of meals. Uh, there is a myth that uh, there is a there is a huge budget in this. Yes, there is a huge budget in this, and the main aim of providing meals. Uh, next slide, no further. The main aim of providing meals is just mainly to eliminate short-term hunger, to ensure that hunger does not become barrier to learning. If children don't have food at home or they have limited food at home, at least they must receive something at school. Also to con contribute to what's required, required daily allowance, some nutrients. And um, uh, it's, 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 it's about 30%. And the um, assumption is that uh, there will be the other 70% uh, they will get from home, uh, it will be part of breakfast, it will be part of supper. And my colleague had indicated that uh, they would want, uh, there could be some means of assisting some schools to provide a uh, breakfast um, in schools. That is very much welcome because it means it's additional uh, RDA that the ch children will Will receive at school and some of them is for after school. Then uh, the two uh, strategic objectives, the yellow and the green one, it, those we call the developmental um, a strategic obje objective, nutrition education. Nutrition education, this is actually, this is meant for a, a, a school community in the school and the community out of the schools. The, we have food handlers that are um, uh, helping with preparation of meals in the schools. Those are the parents of the children. And nutrition education is mainly to provide them with the knowledge of, on food choices, lifestyle, uh, how to handle food so that they preserve the nutrients how to prepare food, food such as soya, which is highly nutritious, which is very cheap, but it will not be palatable if you don't prepare it well. And also the teachers in the schools, as well as the officials that are, uh, 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 that are working for the department, each and every second we have number of officials and they are parents as well. So our thinking is that if we provide them with the knowledge, if we provide them with the, with the skills, this can be 
uh, cascaded to uh, to other communities outside to the the, the the school school environment and also in our caps there is a, a consumer studies and it has nutrition education but those are the subjects that are in most cases not promoted and i hope with this collaboration we will really work towards promoting those subjects and also food safety hygiene and also part of nutrition education is advocacy so informing through different medias um, informing communities informing citizens about a uh, nutritious food and types of nutritious food how to handle a, a, a food in order to preserve the the nutrients then the third one is school food school food gardens it's actually food production any type of food production the easiest is school gardens because it's not affected by the city or a municipality bylaws but we have schools that now are uh, promoting aquaculture and aquaculture is very important because it's both vegetables and the the protein so uh, in in school food gardens mainly it's training on a on, on on food gardening i'm so sorry colleagues it's cold here there are fans so i'm beginning to sneeze <laughs> so you'll pardon me a bit and we take this this area as an area to assist uh, communities school communities to access food and also to make food a uh, a, 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 a available and then also the provision of resources for this and uh, maybe i can mention that with aquaculture it's mainly an ngo and some universities collaborating with some universities and also collaborating with the the the, the, the business sector the business sector is, is is funding this so this this is a, a a collaborative effort and the schools are involved and some of the systems are in the in the in, in the schools in the eastern cape and just one here in in in, in Houghton. those who know kempton park uh, primary schools primary schools can all can can provide maybe maybe attend there and see what uh, uh, they are doing and also the food gardens uh, surely is part of food security in mainly in the eastern cape, eastern cape and limpopo where schools have huge uh, yards those schools some of the schools produce for their own consumption and also produce for the local community consumption because they sell to local to local communities now uh, colleagues, this cannot be <coughs> be done uh, uh, alone. Uh, Nomfundo said we must uh, indicate the role of NGOs, and uh, I was look saying it's it's not only NGOs really; it's the role of everybody. So in the next slide, I am just uh, showing. You can go through. You can you can uh, show everything. Just showing. The, the 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 partners it's it's not even half of the partners that are uh, doing something in the in the in the schools it's business sector it's supporting the meals it's supporting the gardens it's a, a, a supporting advocacy supporting nutrition education it's government departments it's soes it's also higher education institutions and also the ngos i must say the ngos are are playing a very critical role because they are also a, a pleasure group uh, you know when things are not going well they are able to to raise their voices and we are able to work together and ensure that we we provide we do whatever need to be done now i i have a additional information on how more some of the uh, uh, some of the partners are supporting uh, 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 the schools for instance partners like tiger brands and what they provide uh, 
resources for breakfast, including uh, uh, kitchens so that uh, schools can provide meals in a hygienic uh, an environment. Now, the NGOs specifically, I have, I have looked at what they are doing. NGOs have an, a mandate, like WESA has a mandate to advance environmental justice, agricultural uh, 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 education, and nutrition education. So in, in most cases, when I talk to people, I say, each and every one who is contributing to an initiative is going to contribute something and is going to benefit something. And in most cases, I say, if you want to support a school, if you are not going to benefit anything, please take a few steps back and, 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 and check and try to identify what you will benefit because it's always better to get involved in an initiative where there is a benefit, where you know that when you contribute, there's going to be a, a benefit from you. So in most cases, the NGOs that are participating in schools program, they are providing a uh, training. And I want to uh, also um, uh, thank WESA because it's one of the first NGOs that uh, 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 analyzed the caps and identified uh, environmental education uh, topics in the in the caps, and also most of the NGOs are providing an opportunities for hands-on learning uh, uh, camps, take children out on camps and teachers out on excursions. The other thing is to provide learning and teaching resources and also monitoring, which is very, very important. Knowing what is happening in Kanyagudi, what is happening in, in other areas, and research, and also a, 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 a organizing a learners and teachers clubs. The other important aspect of the NGOs is that they have relaxed procedures. You know, in government, our procedures are a little bit stiff because we are working with the taxpayers' money, but NGOs have a little bit relaxed uh, 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 procedures. So when we work with the NGOs, it's, they, they help us in, the, in, 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 in that respect. Now, post-COVID, what we need to do, I think our focus should now be to invest more on livelihood skills. We have seen that with a uh, food parcel is the last slide. We have seen that with uh, food relief, food parcels, we, we don't come, ar come around. They are very important. But as my colleague has indicated, investing in livelihood skills is very, very important. Giving the people means of the ownership to produce their own food and to create their own food uh, systems. Communal gardens neighborhood farming some of the co communities are, 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 are next to the wetlands they are next to the uh, next to the wetlands but they don't do anything with it they have enough land but they don't do anything about that so i think really uh, post covid we need to 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 focus on establishing self reliant and self -reliant sustaining a, a, a communities. Thank you, colleagues. I think uh, that will be my part in short, but uh, the, the next slide, this, this is a school of skills in somewhere in, 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 in Western Cape, Olympiad School of Skills. You, you can see it's the whole production, the whole system, and this is a special school. These raised beds were constructed by the Department of Agriculture because they had, had entered a competition for the Department of Education. So the, one of the, uh, the, 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 the award was to get the raised bed so that children on wheelchairs can also participate in this. These are the children's uh, the, the, the plots. And this is their harvest. They have packaged it 
and they are selling it but they also eat from their from their garden now this is another uh, school of skills so this one is it has a huge garden uh, it, it's huge it's, it's, a, it's almost a farm and then but they also produce the seedlings which they sell to to neighboring communities and in, in, in neighboring schools so that they can uh, also participate in the uh, food production uh, 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 initiative. Thank you colleagues, I will uh, entertain questions. Thank you, Ms. Maduna, for giving us a better understanding on just the government's initiatives and the impact of your program. And I think the two words that have stood out for me were self-reliance and self-sustaining, which is essentially what food sovereignty is all about. Uh, Namiz, I think we will we'll go through to the Q&A session. If we can please start with questions directed at Dr. Misselhorn because she needs to leave early and then we'll end off with questions for Ms. Maduna. Lamise? Okay, we only have two, two questions so far. The first one, um, how can individuals like me support NGOs such as the Lunchbox Fund in advancing your cause? I think Dr. Yeah. I'm muting myself. <laughs> um, we are an incredibly streamlined organization, so we don't have capacity in essence to manage and supervise volunteers and so on. I think the first thing to say about individuals is that, and I was funnily enough just saying this to someone earlier today, is that if every one of us just touch the lives of the people next to us. Imagine the impact that we would have. And it's one of those things that has probably been repeated often all over the world. But if we really stop, and I think we've seen this in COVID-19, I think every single person in that chain of food, emergency food delivery went over and beyond the call of duty. They, whether it was getting a food parcel to one elderly person in the middle of nowhere, or whether it was making sure that our food parcels reached the NGOs that were doing the micro distribution, people really stepped in. And if, if, if everybody's doing that, the impact that we have on lives is, it's the multiplier effect is phenomenal. So that's a very general thought. But um, in terms of, yeah, I mean, Lunchbox Fund, um, as I say, unfortunately, we can't accommodate volunteers. So really, we rely on donations. Um, and we're very fortunate that every cent that, that we're, uh, that's donated to us is actually converted into delivered food because we have our core costs uh, covered by donors who contribute specifically for that. So every, everything else goes to food programming. Um, and every four rand buys a meal for a child at school. So, yeah. Um, but I think that I just have to make a shout out again for the NGOs that have um, that have worked so closely with us over the last few months. There is this is a network. This is a collaborative effort. It's it's not. It's there's no one organisation that that could have done something like this. And then not a question, but then a comment in the chat box. Doctor, Doctor, what's the one thing? Thank you for touching on the question of other stakeholders, roles and assistance. I saw your great efforts in schools such as breakfast provisions at Kama Primary in Eastern Cape. Thank you for touching about the wetlands because a team was sent to Taiwan in the 90s to research on how to farm with rice in wetlands. But we haven't even started any initiatives, especially in the Eastern Cape. Oh, lovely. Thanks. I'm glad to see that the, the breakfast support is, is slowly having an impact and it's something that we, we're expanding all, on all the time. I'm just seeing the last comment. would love to hear from teachers in the webinar regarding the impact of these interventions, such as Lunchbox Fund. And I would love to as well. We do do some impact evaluation. Um, we, we're not, we don't have the capacity to, to uh, and the, the funds essentially, to do large scale impact evaluation, but it would be really great to know we know anecdotally um, from the schools we work with that 
having the food in, in those places enhances participation. And even in some schools, we've seen improvement in matric pass rates. Um, but we'd love to, you know, we'd love to get feedback and also what isn't working, you know, that, that feedback is just as important. Yeah. And then what role can NGOs play in the depolitization of food security and the food system? The D, politicization. Politicization. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, You know, I think NGOs, by definition, because we work in the non-government sector, we don't have uh, much of a political agenda. And so I do think that that means that our primary concern remains meeting the needs of the people we encounter and the people who apply for us for support. So I think that there is an equality in that. And I think that, um, and I think that that balances the inevitably skewed dynamics that occur once politics get, gets involved. And we all know what that looks like. And we all know the challenges that I, I know Ms. Laduna must, um, must come up against it's a lot, the challenges with the NSNP and the fact that it has been fought with corruption in, in the last, you know, however many years of its, of its life. Um, and it's just so sad. And we see that across sectors. So I think that this, that civil society hand in hand with NPOs and NGOs, yeah, very, very important role to play in, in balancing reach and balancing impact and in balancing the conversations like this that take place around food security and, and the importance of, of education and the role of education in food security. Okay, and then this one goes to Ms. Maduna. What measures has the DBE in his NP taken to ensure that they are fully prepared should there be another pandemic. Uh, let, let me start with the depoliticization. Mm -hmm. I think there's a need for our, uh, our society to adopt the, the, the saying that I am my brother or my sister's keeper. Uh, I, I I don't, you know, there is that uh, entire entitlement, you know, and if 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 the, our society can overcome that, I think the cake will be enough for everybody, and there will not be any politicization of anything. But we will look after those who are vulnerable. Now, with regard to better prepared, I don't understand really with the respect to, to, to what. But one thing that I can say is that NSNP was, um, is in, it was conceptualized as an in-school feeding. Children receive meals when they are at school. And even the funding of NSNP, it was for meals to be prepared at school and consumed at school. Uh, when you look at how much a, a plate of meal costs at school, you'll be shocked. It ranges from 280 to, to, three, to 380, a difference of 100 between primary schools and, and, and secondary school. And it, it, it also depends on the number of, of, of children that have to be fed in that, in that, in that uh, province in that province. So uh, some people will say prepare food parcel for, for, for children. If you have to prepare a food parcel, it becomes expensive. But when food is prepared in bulk at a school, at a school, we take advantage of the economies of, of scale. So the rent can be stretched. But as soon as you say take your rent and take your rent or take your, your ration, then the package becomes a, a, a smaller so i don't know what would be what uh, that mean would be does that mean a uh, feeding when the schools are closed uh, if that means that uh, that is something that we are working on working, working on thank you okay thanks and then do you have a database that you work on that you use to distribute the lunchbox initiative to school. How do you get on that database? 
So we work on a, we have people applying, organizations applying all the time to us. We have a very long wait list. We have a, um, a series of hunger maps that were developed in-house using primarily the South African Index of Multiple Deprivation. So to give a, a, a geographic mapped picture at sub-municipal level of where, where child vulnerability is in South Africa. Um, and, you know, if you look at that, you'll obviously see blotches of red all over the country. Um, and some provinces fare worse than others. I mean, for example, Northern KZ and the Kanyakuda district has been food insecure and afflicted by HIV AIDS for a very long time. You always get high variability, even in the same community in food insecurity. So you can never use maps for targeting. We, we do need to consider economies of scale. So once we start working in a community, we'll, we will we like to reach additional schools within that geographic area. Um, all our food is delivered to the school's door and signed at the door. So we do that last mile delivery, uh, delivery system and we monitor it. So uh, it is impractical to reach one school in one province and another school, you know, miles mm -hmm. and miles away. Mm -hmm. But we do reach all nine provinces. Um, and as we grow, as people apply to us for food support, we obviously look at the mapping, we look at where we're working now, um, we try and take need into consideration um, and potential impact into consideration. Um, Nongfundo, colleagues, what my colleague ha has reiterated is very important, uh, that uh, it's, it's, it's sometimes very difficult to spread yourself all over. So if other NGOs would like to replicate what a uh, lunchbox is doing, the best would be to replicate it, learn from them and take another area instead of spreading all over. We have seen that a uh, model working very efficiently. If they are in Mkanyakute, then the next district would be, let's say, Nakamudiru Mlema, let's say, a certain municipality. Then an, another NGO can just take that a, a, a municipality and make an impact on, 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 on it. Yeah, just to add to that, and for that exact reason, we don't work, so we, will, we, we won't work in schools or in communities where another um, school nutrition organization is working. Um, where our, our focus is to try and reach as many kids as possible with that, with that essential hunger reducing school nutrition. Um, I think, you know, for me, I think what's, what's so exciting in the work that we do is we do one thing and we're very specialized and we do it well and we monitor it very closely. Where you get the multiplier effect is when you work with, you collaborate with other organizations. So one of our key collaborating area, uh, areas will be um, early child development facilitator training. So we will collaborate with the Kotlins, with Smart Start, with organizations that are training child facilitators, early child development facilitators to provide that stimulation and care that's meaningful and that has impact. And together with that, in the same environment, we're offering a nutritious meal. And the sum of the holes is, is greater than, you know, the, than the parts and some of the parts. The whole thing is, the impact is, um, is, is that the idea of resource stacking is, of course, Elifa Love Antoine's baby, I think. But um, it's, it's a very powerful thing for, for multiple organizations to be bringing their expertise to the same beneficiaries. And Nofundo, it seems like that's all questions that we have for the panelists. Um, we can move on to concluding remarks. Okay, thank you, Lamise. Um, I think we are looking good on time. Um, Dr. Nisongo needs to head off in about 15 minutes. So I think we'll take uh, concluding remarks uh, from both our speakers. We'll start with uh, Dr. Nisongo. Thank you. Yeah, I think that, I mean, I think one thing that's really stood out for me, it's been great to hear from Ms. Maduna about the, the NSNP and particularly exciting to hear um, this sort of renewed focus on, on skills and on livelihoods. Um, that's something that's very close to my heart. And I, I think it's something that 
we're seeing, of course, across education and private education and government education, we are seeing an increased focus on, on skills rather than content. Um, and I think that's something that's, that's so important with young people. I've seen it in my own children. So it's very exciting to hear that that flavor is coming through um, with DBE and, and the NSNP. It's great. Thank you, Dr. Misselhorn, uh, for your presentation today and giving us so much uh, to take away. Uh, if we can go to Ms. Maduna for just parting words uh, from today's uh, conversation. Thank you very much once again for the opportunity and I hope we'll have another opportunity to have uh, these discussions. What I can say is that the Department of Education, NSNP in particular, employs around six, plus minus 6,000 parents in the school nutrition program. And as my colleague has indicated that if you are dealing with a community, give it a full, full, full package. If these parents, after two years of interaction, and being a captive audience in the school can go away with a skill of planting, let's say two, three green vegetables, pumpkin, yellow vegetables, and also with a skill of how to cook food to preserve the nutrients. When we get the next cohort in the next uh, 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 financial year, then that will be a bonus to, 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 to the community. So other NGOs that are listening, uh, our request will be for them to join hands with us to provide these, um, these are an unemployed parents, these parents with the skills so that they are also able to look after their families, which include school going children. Thank you, Ms. Maduna, for giving us food for thought. And I think that brings us to the end. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists uh, for today. I'd like to give a big thanks to our attendees for joining today's webinar. I think we need more of such engagements uh, between the various stakeholders to really be able to strengthen implementation at grassroots level. We, we need to build systems that would really empower communities to radically transform our current unsustainable food systems and really for this we need a socially just and environmentally sustainable food system one that is steady one that really supports food justice and that really can can withstand pandemics such as the COVID-19 pandemic we know that when we empower communities that this can lead to lasting social change and really schools as the heartbeats of communities are perfectly suited to advance the cause of food sovereignty in South Africa. And I think as WESA and other NGOs, we can really play a key role in, in the transformation of these food systems by providing training and resources. Mm -hmm. Example, things like garden-based learning programs, uh, mm -hmm. To, better in, to instill better nutritional choices and teaching about food justice. And I think that's it for me. My parting words for today are greed can never be sustainable and really healthy food is a right, it's not a privilege. Thank you. And that's it for me, Lamise. Thank you very much, Nomfundo. Before um, we leave, um, just want to share with our audience that our next webinar will be on the 5th of November. Um, it will be facilitated by my colleague, Ria Tabati. And the topic is Pathways of Youth into Green Careers. So we really look forward to um, having everyone join us for that topic. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Um, on the series so far. As I said, this is the third one and we're looking forward to having you on the next one. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.